Today we can make the United Kingdom the first major economy in the world to commit to ending our contribution to global warming forever. In 2019, the UK was the first G7 country to set a net zero target. And with that, it was an important inspiration and motivation to other countries globally to also pursue such new climate targets. Well, net zero matters to us because it's about the future of our planet. It's about the future of our lives, the future of our economy, the future of our societies. So we need to take net zero seriously. We can't pretend it's not happening. We've seen in all the studies that if we don't get to net zero, the climate will continue to warm. And as it continues to warm, all these other um, effects will carry on as well. My name is Joanna Haig. Um, by training, I am an atmospheric physicist. I started uh, in physics in general, and then I became more and more interested in environment and atmospheric physics. Eventually, um, I seem to have ended up as co-director of the Grantham Institute on Climate Change and Environment, which was a great privilege and I enjoyed it enormously. 2019 felt special. I think partly because there was so much energy behind it, so much momentum building from all aspects of society, right the way from grassroots organisations, through scientists, through government bodies and policy makers and businesses and everybody, I think was almost on message then and they really wanted to do something about it. The Grantham Institute's main concern was and is climate change and its effects. One thing that we did was um, write a report which was submitted to the Climate Change Committee um, indicating on how we could, as a country, uh, meet the, th the emission reduction targets. As well as writing reports, uh, we also got more involved with people around and what they were thinking and doing. Thousands of pupils in the UK expected a walk out of class later today to take part in a series of global youth protests about climate change. Several of us from the Institute walked down to Westminster wearing special t-shirts saying, I'm a scientist, ask me questions, and uh, joined the uh, demonstration at Parliament and did answer a lot of questions and it was really engaging to be talking to so many enthused people. I'm Yuri Rogel, I'm Director of Research at the Grantham Institute and a Professor of Climate Science and Policy here at Imperial College. And I was one of the coordinating lead authors of the IPCC 1.5 degree special report. In 2019 there was a set of conditions that came together and made it the perfect time to set net zero targets. First of all there was the Paris Agreement that was adopted in 2015. That Paris Agreement set out a target to limit warming well below 2 degrees while pursuing to limit warming to 1.5. It also set a global net zero target. It says that countries need to reduce their emissions as soon as possible to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions in the second half of the century. After that, came the IPCC special report on 1.5. On the one hand, it showed that there was a critical difference in the impacts and the damages and the harms that we can expect between a 1.5 degree world and a 2 degree world. On the other hand, the report also shows the solutions, the ways in which our societies can transform to limit warming towards 1.5. In 2019 is then the ideal moment for an ambitious country that has the global goal, that has the political target, but also the scientific evidence to understand how to do it, to now also set in domestic legislation the goal to reach net zero emissions. My name is Theresa May. I was the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom from 2016 to 2019. And it was when I was Prime Minister uh, that we introduced the net zero by 2050 target into legislation, the first major economy in the world to do so. What we saw in 2019, I think, was a growing sense that COP, the conference that had taken place in Paris, which had led to the Paris Accord, which was the commitment around the world to take action on climate change, to reduce the increase in temperature. There was a sense that there'd been a big moment and yet things are perhaps starting to slip away and we needed to reinforce the message. And of course what we had seen was uh, a new American administration taking a different view to the, the Paris Accord. And I think partly why in 2019 this sense that Paris had been a big moment, there'd been a critical commitment around the world, were we living up to that? We needed another moment. 
When the Climate Change Committee produced this report that said we needed to get to net zero by 2050, I coordinated a letter written to Prime Minister Theresa May, which was co-signed by a number of other scientists from around the country, asking her to put it in legislation and showing what an amazing effect that would have on government policy. Well, we were rather surprised that about two weeks later, we were uh, told that Mrs May was going to visit Imperial College and make an announcement. And indeed she came and she announced that they were going to put net zero by 2050 into law. We were cheering. <laughs> The UK has become the first major economy to shut down its last coal-fired power station in a turning point for the nation that sparked the Industrial Revolution. The effects of the 2019 UK's net zero goal can already be seen, not only domestically, where now the Committee on Climate Change and the UK government is pursuing consecutive carbon budgets that slowly but surely reduce the climate pollution that the UK is putting into the atmosphere towards zero by mid-century, but also globally, where now over a hundred countries have set net zero targets, which critically bent the curve of our projections of where global warming leads to over the course of the century. Indeed, some countries have put it, uh, an earlier target than 2050 into place, but it was significant in that it led the field and, if you like, it pushed others into taking the same view. These legal targets of the Climate Change Act and the UK's net zero target are really pioneering globally. With the establishment of the Committee on Climate Change and the continued importance of the scientific evidence that the UK is receiving from that committee, it is also a pioneer in evidence-based policy making. Any sensible government is going to approach science by recognising that, that is a resource, that science can inform government decisions, but also that science can be an innovator. Scientific research can lead to economic developments, to economic growth. Uh, so government needs to be very aware of science. I thought it was important to make this announcement at Imperial, which is a centre of research, a centre of scientific innovation, uh, because it is innovation and research that is going to take us forward, that it will enable us ultimately to do what we need to do in order to maintain the future of our planet. It gives opportunities to develop products that can be not just used and sold here in the UK, but across the rest of the world. It gives the opportunity of ensuring that our industry, that our construction, that our way of life is better prepared for the, uh, for the future. But it also means avoiding some of the costs of not doing anything. A lot of people say that working to reach net zero is very expensive, but actually there is a cost to not achieving net zero. When we think about climate change in the United Kingdom, there is a vast range of impacts that we have to deal with. People are increasingly going to feel the effects of climate change. Indeed, they already have with the, the heat waves that we've been having, with the water shortages that we're now having imposed, with the extreme rainfall, with floods. It's not going to get any less. And if we don't do something about it, it's just going to get worse and people will suffer. This is based on the science. It is based on what has been seen happening around our world. In 2019, when we introduced the legislation, as a Conservative government, there was support across the House of Commons. So it was a cross-party consensus that this mattered. Um, now, sadly, that cross-party consensus is starting to break down. Unfortunately, in uh, recent times, the uh, whole idea of net zero has become politically charged, such that some political parties are actually picking it up, denying its necessity and arguing against it. This is really, really scary because the science on net zero hasn't changed. Absolutely, we need to get to net zero or the warming will continue and the adverse effects will continue. And uh, we'll be getting worse and worse and worse. And people need to understand that that's going on. Um, so that we can act on it sooner rather than later. I think one of the things we need to do is just remind people about some of the changes in weather that have been happening around the world, about some of the things that we're already seeing. And I always think about the UK and its role in the Commonwealth. If we don't get to grips with climate change, some of the member states of the Commonwealth will simply not exist in future. 
because the oceans will rise and they will be wiped away. So I think we have a double responsibility in the UK. Responsibility for us, uh, for people in the UK, for our economy in the UK and the impact climate change is having on that, but also a wider responsibility as well. We can't escape the climate reality and we understand it will only worsen as long as we keep emitting climate pollution into the atmosphere. This target is not only important for its symbolism, but really to set the pace of the transition and to set the direction of the transition that is required. It is undoubtedly that achieving a net zero transition is challenging, but the world that we are working towards is a more desirable one. It's one where we have better and cleaner air, where we have healthier habits and we live better and more desirable lives. And it is really therefore that setting this net zero target, setting this key milestone of this transition is so momentous. <laughs>